Hello and welcome. We're Bob and Penny Lord. By the world's standards, the saint that we're going to share with you today should never have become a priest. Thank God we don't follow the world's standards. This is about a priest and all those unsung priests who are taken for granted, unloved, and often crucified. For the many hours, week after week, they've sat alone, waiting for us to come to be reconciled with our Savior, and we have not. This is for every holy mass they've celebrated, victim priest with our Lord on the altar. This is for their yes, especially on those dry days when they felt nothing. John Mary Vianney was born in a little village five miles north of Lyon, France. He began to pray from on his mother's knee, his two greatest treasures, his rosary and a little wooden statue of Mary. Years later, the curie of ours, nearly 70 years old, still spoke of the lady he loved. The Blessed Virgin is my oldest love. I loved her even before I knew her. The church was underground but alive. Religious worship was strictly forbidden. Priests, dressed as lay people, secretly conducted services. One day, a priest came to the Vianney home. John was 11 years old. When the priest discovered he had never gone to confession, he not only heard his first confession, he arranged for him to study catechism. He was 13 when he received First Holy Communion. The shades were drawn to prevent detection by the authorities. As a grown man, he was still unable to speak of that days without tears coming to his eyes. When we received communion, we sensed something extraordinary, a great joy, a consolation, a well-being that permeates our whole being and makes us tremble. We cannot but say with St. John, it is the Lord. Oh my God, what joy for a Christian to get up from the sacred banquet and go forth with all heaven in his heart. When John was 16, he shared with his mother and aunt, if I were a priest, I would want to win many souls. A simple country boy with only an ele elementary school education? Impossible. Father Bali came to town one day to promote vocations. After John's mother persuaded her husband, she pleaded with Father Bali to accept him. Although he was not very sympathetic at first, when Father met John, he said yes. John had a problem memorizing, especially Latin. A young tutor, furious because John couldn't retain what he just taught him, slapped him in front of the other students. Here John was almost 20 years old, and this 12-year-old slapped him. To everybody's surprise, John went down on his knees and begged his forgiveness. They became lifelong friends. In the fall of 1809, John received orders to report to the army. Although Father Bali argued that seminarians and priests were exempt, John had to go. Two days after he arrived at a military depot, he landed in a hospital. Two weeks later, on his way to join his battalion, he landed in a hospital again. Six weeks later, too weak to make it across the Pyrenees Mountains, just to join his company in Spain, he meets up with a deserter who invites him to stay with him until the war is over. Too exhausted to refuse, John reluctantly followed him. John went to the mayor of the town who advised him to stay and teach school. The townspeople loved him, but John was concerned about his parents. A woman from the town went to reassure his mother and father that he was safe. Father Bally consoled his mother, Mother, don't worry about your son. He is neither dead or sick. He's never going to be a soldier. He's going to be a priest. She never lived to see that prophecy fulfilled. John entered the junior seminary. He had to take one year of philosophy and theology in Latin. Now, 26 years old, he was again the oldest in his class. His next step toward the priesthood, the major seminary, was still by way of the cross. His studies there, no easier for him than they were in the junior seminary. Fellow seminarians testified as, at his beatification process. His outstanding qualities were his devotion to Jesus, Mary, and his vocation, his humility, his abandonment, his total abandonment to God's will, 
and his frequent failure but persistent struggle to keep up with his courses. A priest called him a simple man with nothing extraordinary about him, but nevertheless a saint. He was dismissed from the major seminary because of failing marks. Well, if he couldn't become a priest, he'd be a brother. When John shared this decision with Father Bally, he informed him he would not become a brother, he'd study with him. And so they began again. When John took the test again, he failed miserably. Father Bally pleaded he'd be tested in Ecoli, where John had confidence. John passed. He entered the subdiaconate. A priest present at his ordination testified, I had the good fortune to be very close to Abbe Vianney that day. His face was radiant. Inwardly, I applied to him the verse, and you, child, shall be a prophet of the Most High, thinking to myself, he has less knowledge than some others, but he will do great things in the sacred ministry. When at last he was given his final examination, all his years of prayer, persistence, courage, and loyalty paid off. August the 13th, 1815, John Mary Vianney was ordained a priest, truly another Christ. He best described what it meant to him. Oh, how great a person is the priest. The priest will truly only understand himself when he gets to heaven. If we understood what the priesthood means, we would die, not from fright, but from love. Abbe John Vianney was appointed curate to Father Bally, and the next two and a half years spent long hours praying, practicing penance, and studying church doctrines with him. With the help of the Holy Bible, the lives of the saints, and the early Desert Fathers, they were able to live a life that would terrify most of us today. They fought not only their French love for food, but the barest needs of comfort in the flesh. When their extreme penances were reported to the Chancery, the response was, people of Equally, you're fortunate to have priests doing such penance for you. But in December 1817, the little curate administered last rites to his pastor, teacher, and friend, Father Bali. Eccoli was unaware of the prophet in their midst. The new pastor felt there was no need of an assistant. Less than two months after his friend's death, John Vianney was sent to Ars. The priest who assigned him prophesied, there isn't much love of God in that parish. You will put some love of God into it. Ours, more a mission than a parish, was impoverished materially and spiritually. The people were not hostile to the church, they just didn't care. No one, with the exception of one devout lady, wanted a priest or a church in ours. The townspeople claimed the village was far too small for one church, but not for four taverns. Mm -hmm. And this is where the curé was to practice his ministry. The curé Vianney, who walked towards ours, looked older than his 32 years. His emaciated frame was topped by auburn hair, which would turn prematurely white. As he asked the young shepherd the way to ours, the curé spoke of his purpose for coming there. You have shown me the road to ours. I will show you the road to heaven. Over the years, his parishioners overheard him praying as he prostrated himself before the Blessed Sacrament. Dear God, I beg you to convert my parish. I am willing to suffer anything you want as long as I live. People came from far and near to hear the curé. Like Jesus, he used the countryside and things familiar to them and himself. Souls were touched, their hearts pierced by the arrow of the Father's love that sailed through the air as he preached. He loved them and they loved him, and it was this love that converted them more than even his arguments. If it is true the best preacher is one who loves God most, then surely that would have to apply to the curie of ours. Conversion is a slow, painful process, but change was coming about. The faithful attended Mass on Sunday and feast days. They recited the rosary, attended vespers and catechism classes. They came even during the week. 
Instead of swearing and foul language, hymns could be heard coming from the fields. Farmers said their rosary, fingering their beads as they plowed the land. Families prayed together. At the sound of the Angelus, work stopped and they dropped to their knees. They prayed. The young pastor was unhappy with the poor education provided by a visiting teacher. With little or no money, he opened up a free private school. From the start, it was a success. People from surrounding towns began to send their children. They had a problem, they had to travel. So he opened a shelter, La Providence. A priest does not give up having a family, but instead has a large family. Mm -hmm. His students and teachers were the cure's family. His little girls became prayer warriors. He brought his brokenness and his deep concern for poor sinners to them, and they prayed, and miracles abounded. Ten years before his death, the curé was forced to give up supervision of the institution he so loved and founded. There had been complaints, 60 students in a space meant for 20, and worse, the wealthy did not want their daughters going to school with the poor and orphaned. Grievances were lodged, and the bishop asked the curé to turn over the school. This almost broke his heart. One of his teachers wrote, it was a great sacrifice for him because after he had turned everything over, he felt he could not and should not interfere in the affair of others. He completely withdrew from it. The curé waged an ongoing battle against the many temptations with the too many taverns, never giving up till they closed down. He made many enemies among tavern owners, dance hall proprietors, and their patrons. They wanted to kill him. They grumbled and whispered and plotted. He was accused of misconduct. He was even denounced to the bishop. Although he called this the best time in his life, he suffered and cried, not for himself, but for those he couldn't reach. In later years, he shared, if I had known when I arrived at ours all that I would have to suffer there, I would have died on the spot. Mm -hmm. At his beatification process, witnesses said he was so tired of all the evil rumors that people were spreading about him that he wanted to leave the parish. Indeed, he would have done so if someone had not come to him and convinced him that his departure could appear to confirm these sordid attacks. The curé began to have nightly visits from the devil, usually when someone was about to return to the sacraments of the church. Through the confessional, he was calling many to new life, and the devil was furious. His fellow priests mocked him. One night, some priests staying at the rectory heard strange noises coming from the curé's room. When they questioned him the next day, he answered, it's the grappin. He is furious about the good that is being accomplished here. Annoyed, the priest snapped, you don't do you had it's all in your head. You have rats running around in your brain. It was useless for the curate to say, if it is in my head, why do you hear it? That night, there was a deafening roar. The priests panicked, afraid the house would cave in. They charged into the curate's room, sure he was being killed. But the curate was sound asleep. His bed had been dragged into the center of the room. When they awakened him, he apologized. The grappin dragged out the bed. I'm sorry, I should have warned you. But it's a good sign. We'll catch a big fish tomorrow. Imagine the fun his fellow priests had when tomorrow came and nothing happened. But when evening came, there was a knock at the door. A nobleman who had long ceased receiving the sacraments wanted the cure to hear his confession. No longer did they kid him. Now it was, the curé is a saint. We've spoken of pain and trials. Like with other saints, the curé embraced his daily cross because of the joys in his life, the greatest of which was the Holy Eucharist. For him, the greatest sign of the Lord's triumph in his parish was the extraordinary effort the people of ours put into making the procession of the Blessed Sacrament on the Feast of Corpus Christi so magnificent. 
once looked down upon, this village became the focus of worldwide pilgrimages in the 19th century, drawing Frenchmen from all parts of France. Unless we give you the impression that this came about right away, it was bought with 10 years of blood, sweat, suffering, tears, rejection, and struggle. The curé saying over and over again, I am nothing, God is everything. I can do nothing of myself, God can do everything. The souls of men belong to God, they were made for God. And the reason I came into the world, the reason I am here, is to give them God. His brother priests did everything to stop their parishioners from going to ours, even to the point of speaking out against the curé from the pulpit. He received letters condemning him. A young pastor from a nearby village wrote what could be a sample. Monsieur le curé, anyone who knows as little theology as you should not enter a confessional. The curé humbly answered, my very dear and very revered colleague, I have so many reasons to love you. You are the only person who has really known me well. Since you are so kind and charitable as to take an interest in my soul, please help me to obtain the favor I have been asking for so long that I may be replaced in a post of which I am unworthy because of my ignorance, so I can retire into some little corner to weep over my poor life. I have so much penance to do. I have so much atonement to make, so many tears to shed. Generous, loving, and humble, he disarmed his enemies and was finally accepted by his brother priests. A day in the life of the curé began with him rising at one in the morning when he would make his way to the church by candlelight. Many had waited days and guards were needed to keep the faithful from pushing to be first. Before entering the confessional, he knelt at the foot of the altar and prayed for the strength, wisdom, and love necessary to be the Lord's instrument. He'd remain in the confessional for as much as seven hours straight interrupting this sacrament only to celebrate another sacrament, the Holy Eucharist. Between hearing confessions and celebrating Mass, he led the faithful reciting the rosary. He spent no more than five minutes gulping down a small meal. He took a cat nap of maybe another five minutes, then quickly returned to hear confessions. Since the curé spent between 16 and 17 hours in the confessional, his young associate pastor thought it only reasonable he should have his bedroom. The curé used it so little. This coveted bedroom consisted of an old chest, a few pictures of saints, and some old threadbare books on theology. Hundreds of thousands passed through the curtain of the curé's confessional. He faithfully and tirelessly carried the cross of men's sins and their sorrows for 30 years, never too tired, too disillusioned or too broken to say yes one more time and listen, loving and speaking with the heart and the mind of his Savior. It is said that his mind was never touched, tormented by arrogant knowledge, riches, and human honors for which the crowd strives, laments, and constantly aspires. The God who rewards and sustains love of neighbor, who relieves and consoles, this is all the good priest knows, and especially all that he teaches. In St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, we hear this prophet speaks to men for their upbuilding, their encouragement, their consolation. Such a prophet was St. John Vianney. One day the curé asked a man if it wasn't about time he confessed his sins, the man said it had been 30 years. The curé corrected, how about 33 years? <laughs> the man meekly followed the curé, confessed his sins, and 20 minutes later was filled with a joy and a peace he'd never known in his life. There was a woman who regularly came to the curé for confession. One day, frightened that she was seriously ill, she went to a sorcerer for a potion. Mm. She hid it before entering the church. 
As she finished confessing her sins, the curé said, my good child, you aren't telling me about the vial you hid in the bushes. <laughs> After the curé gave her absolution, she ran to where she had hidden the potion and threw it away. A man came to the curé and pleaded he pray for his crippled child. The curé led the father into the confessional. He'd been away from the sacraments for many years. As the curé absolved him, the child stood up and walked. There were many healings through this powerful confessor and his tireless administration of the sacrament of penance. Like in Lourdes, often they were healings of the spirit as well as the physical. His catechism classes were more like little sermons. When he gave instructions in the church, he was acutely aware of the Lord and the blessed sacrament. Although he had a pulpit placed on the right side of the sanctuary, so his back was not to the tabernacle, Christ was so present to him in the blessed sacrament, his voice would tremble with emotion as he spoke. It was a time of miracles. There was the miracle of the multiplication of the flour. There wasn't enough flour to feed all the girls in the school. They went to the curé, who told them to use the little they had. Taking the small amount they had, they began to knead it. The dough rose above the trough as if they needed a large sack of flour. Then there was the miracle of the wine. One day the curé told his people a full cask of wine had spilled onto the sand floor. When they investigated, the cask was empty. They were barely able to collect two tiny pails of clear wine. They poured what little they had into a cask which was nearly empty. To their amazement, they kept drawing from that cask for days. When people tried to give the curé credit for miracles occurring in the parish, he always pointed to God and the intercession of the saints, especially his Saint Philomena. He insisted, I do not work miracles. I am only a poor, ignorant man who once tended sheep. Turn to Saint Philomena. I have never asked for anything through her without receiving it. This was and is the kind of leaven the Lord will work with. The greatest single miracle of ours was the living out day by day of who he was. John Mary Vianney, curé, holy priest, and pastor. He was a man for all seasons. He loved the church of the 19th century, and he revered the church which stood on the foundation of centuries of faithfulness and martyrdom. He passionately knew and loved our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament whose presence brought tears to the curie's eyes. He said, if we had a lively faith, we would certainly be able to see him in the Blessed Sacrament. There are priests who see him every day during the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Many believe he was speaking of himself when he spoke about these priests, but the curie would never have admitted that, never wanting attention brought to himself. Our curie was blessed by Our Lady's appearance. Now, this didn't come from him, but from Mlle. Duryea, an eyewitness who testified at his beatification process. On May the 8th, 1840, when she arrived at the rectory, she heard voices coming from the curé's room. She quickly ascended the steps and listened at the door. And she heard the curé say, Good mother, I asked for the conversion of sinners, the consolation of the afflicted, the relief of the sick, especially a lady who has long been suffering and is begging either to die or to be cured. A lady's voice answered, she will get well, but later on. Mademoiselle Duryea knew she was a sick person as she had been suffering a long time with cancer. She rushed into the room. Standing in front of the fireplace was a lady of medium height, breathtakingly beautiful. Mademoiselle pleaded with our lady to take her to heaven. Our blessed mother told her she would always be her child and she would always be with her, but she had to wait. And the Blessed Mother disappeared. The curé was standing in front of a, a table. His hands were clasped in prayer upon his breast, his eyes motionless. Mademoiselle pulled at his cassock and told him she'd seen the Blessed Mother. He told her he had too, but to tell no one. On August the 15th, three and a half months later, Mademoiselle Durier was cured of cancer. What makes a saint? <clears throat> no hours too long, no sacrifice too great, 
The curé lived, breathed, and worked solely to love God and to bring others to know and love him. As Jesus was crucified for the salvation of souls, so the curé was crucified by sinful souls. At the end of his life, he said, oh, the sinners will finally kill the poor sinner. The curé spoke of going home, the hours spent as prisoner of the confessional, the fasts and penances, and his victimhood with Jesus on the altar were taking their final merciful toll. The little humble priest God had chosen to do such great work on earth was at last to have his heart's true desire to spend eternity loving him. Summer came, and with it cruel, stifling, choking heat, the curé asked for his confessor. As he, as he received our Lord in the Holy Communion, he cried, Ah, when I think I am about to receive the Lord for the last time. And then, touched by the generosity of his king, he whispered, How good God is. When we cannot go to see him, he comes to us. He kissed the crucifix, and as his confessor came to the words, May God's holy angels come to meet him and to bring him into the heavenly Jerusalem, the curé fell into the sweet sleep of eternity. Without struggle, he gave up his spirit to the angel who had surely come to bring him home. There was a groan from the faithful that he left behind. The curé was dead. The pilgrims came more than 6,000. It was not until August 14th that the body was put in a, in a sarcophagus. Till today, you can see and venerate the incorrupt body of the curé of ours. A humble priest who lived and died for God each moment of his life was specially honored by God's church. He was beatified in St. Peter's Basilica 40 years after his death. May 31st, 1925, Pope Pius XI canonized the curé, Saint John Mary Vianney. France had a new saint, and parish priests had a patron saint, one whose life was simple to follow, but difficult to live. The curé always kept his eyes on Jesus crucified, on his Savior who allowed himself to be humbled even to death on the cross. He opened his arms wide to love like this Lord he adored, who before him loved as his Father in heaven loves. And he trusted in that love to bring him through the daily trials, temptations, and hurts of his victimhood as a priest.